All right, everyone, we're going to take a look at our friction worksheet here now. And uh, as I said, we're going to go over uh, each of the questions here, even though there is seven of them. A couple of them are going to go very, very quickly for us. And uh, those that uh, aren't going so quickly, uh, then they're more challenging questions. We need to go over those anyways. Question number one says, a 25-kilogram block initially at rest, initially at rest, so it's, it's sitting there. It, right now, it's in static equilibrium. It's on a rough horizontal surface. Then we apply a force of 75 newtons to it, so maybe not static equilibrium anymore. Apply a force of 75 newtons that's required to set the block in motion. 60 newtons required to keep it in motion once we've got it going. What do we got here? The 75 newton force, tell me what that represents in this question. Yeah. Yeah, the force, this is the case in a lot of questions that we see. The force that's required to get something moving corresponds to the maximum possible force of static friction. So let's write that down. Okay, we know what the mass is here, 25 kilograms. We know that the FSF max, the maximum force of static friction, is 75 newtons. Now, we got a force of 60 newtons here as well. What's that one correspond to? Yeah, the force of kinetic friction once it's moving. Look, if it's moving at a constant speed, and I'm pushing on it with 60 newtons to keep it moving at a constant speed, then friction must be pushing back with the same force. Otherwise, it would either speed up or slow down if those forces didn't balance. So we're going to say FSF max is 75. The force of kinetic friction, once we get it moving, the force of kinetic friction is 60 newtons. We want to know the coefficient of static friction. And we want to know the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu s and mu k. So let's say uh, f s f max is equal to mu s times the normal force. Let's say mu s is equal to f s f max, the maximum force of static friction divided by the normal force. So we got 75 newtons here divided by the normal force. The normal force for us right now, at least is always going to be equal to what? Yeah, Aiden? Close. It's not 9.81, but I know exactly where you're coming from on that one. Really? Mass times 9.81. So it's going to be 25 times 9.81 here. And we're just going to drop the negative sign for that, right? So it's going to be just 25 times positive 9.81. That gives us 0 0.24. Um, no, 0 0.31. No units. Okay, units cancel out here, so it's just a number. 0 0.31 is my coefficient of static friction. My coefficient of kinetic friction would be found in a real similar way. We just say mu k is equal to F, uh, kf, force of kinetic friction, divided by the normal force. So that's going to be uh, 60 newtons divided by 75, 25 times 9.81, uh, which is going to give me a value of 0 0.24, which... Look, we should expect the coefficient of static friction to be bigger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. All right? Question number two says, here in the question really was these two numbers. The 75 newtons as my max force of static friction and my 60 newtons as my force of kinetic friction once I got it. All right, question number two. This one is a little bit easier, I think. The coefficient of static friction is 0 0.50. What's the max force that can be applied to the object before it starts moving? Um, F, S, F, max. Equal to mu times the normal force. 0 0.50. And again, the normal force for us right now is always M times G, 10 times 9.1. I think that's going to give me, yeah, 49 newtons. So, listen, I got 49 newtons here. That doesn't mean the force of static friction will always be 49 newtons. That's the maximum force. If I push on it with 30 newtons, the force of friction is not 49. It's 30. If I push on it with 48, the force of friction is 48. The maximum force that I can push with before it begins to move is 49. Now they start getting a bit trickier. 
a 100 kilogram object moving at 20 meters per second comes to a stop over a distance of 40 meters, what's the coefficient of dynamic friction or kinetic friction here? Mass is 100 kilograms. This is 20 meters per second. Velocity, obviously, right? VI, VF, just V. What's it going to be here, right? VI, good. The initial velocity. And we're going to say our displacement is 40 meters. Is there anything else we have here if we read between the lines? Anything else here, Derek? VF is zero, good. The final velocity is zero meters per second because it comes to a stop, right? We talked about that early on in the course. That's one of the things that you guys are really good at is, is catching those reading in between the line things. You know, when it says it comes to a stop, recognizing that VF is zero. What's the coefficient of kinetic friction or dynamic friction? Well, we have only one equation that will give us kinetic friction. And that's this one. Let's say mu is equal to FKF over FN. Didn't really give you very much space to write on this, did it? Okay, FN is 100 times 9.81. That's pretty straightforward. But what's FF? What's the force of friction here? Well, what we're going to do is say, look, if there's only one force acting, and that's friction, well, then that force of friction would be equal to F is equal to M times A, the first equation we've learned in this unit. But we don't know the acceleration, so we've got to find that some way. I'm going to say VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2AD. When we solve for A there, we're going to get negative 5.0 meters per second squared. Please do yourself a favor. Work through that to make sure you can get negative 5. Now, I'm not showing you right now how to get negative 5 there, the rearranging of that. Please work through that to make sure you can get that, though. If you can't, then you need to ask me a question so that I can help you with the rearranging of that. The mass here is 100 times negative 5 gives me negative 500 newtons, which I'm going to turn around and plug into here as my force of kinetic friction. Negative 500 divided by 100 times 9.81. Do the math there. Works out to be 0 0.51 as my coefficient of friction. Again, please, please, please. If this makes sense to you, that's great. But work through it yourself to make sure that you can actually get it, not just to make sure that it makes sense. Yeah, that's great on a test if it makes sense to you. But if you can't get the answer on the test, it's still true. Even if you do get it. Good question just asked here, guys. Um, we've just found my force of friction to be negative 500. Okay. Lewis just said, should the uh, final answer be negative 0.51? No. Coefficient of friction is always positive. Value, but I do have a mistake in it, so I know where you're coming from. The force of friction is negative 500. That's correct. But over here, we're not looking for the force of friction. We're looking for the, the magnitude of the force of friction. So what do we do with that negative? Yeah, we drop it. So that should be 500, positive 500 over that, not negative 500. Same? Yes, it does. Yeah, that's a good question as well. The little arrow over it means it's a vector. Force is always a vector. doesn't matter what kind of force we have. I mean, if logically, if we think about it, right, you're stopping. You're moving to the right. Friction must act to the left. Friction has a direction. Right? Um, but the reason that we put the absolute value signs around that is because this equation can't tell us what the direction is. We put the arrow over it to, to remind us that there is a direction. But we put the absolute value signs around it to remind us that even though there is a direction, we can't get the direction from the equation. We have to get it some other way. Okay, let's take a look at number four. 
This one's a tough one, actually. This one's a tough one. And this one says, a hockey puck hit, is hit on a frozen lake and starts moving with a velocity of 12 meters per second. Five seconds later, it's six meters per second. What's the coefficient of friction between the puck and the ice? What kind of friction is it, by the way? Is it static or is it kinetic friction that's causing this puck to slow down from 12 to six meters per second? Yep, good, it's kinetic friction. Sliding friction, right? That's, here's a good place where that, that word sliding helps us out in determining what kind of friction it is. Sliding friction, kinetic, dynamic friction. We want to find the coefficient of friction there. We know that VI is 12 meters per second. We know that VF is 6 meters per second. Uh, we know the time here is 5.0 seconds. We want to find the coefficient of kinetic friction. Hmm. Interesting. One thing that I can do here is find the acceleration. It's uh, 12 minus 6, or 6 over 5, which gives me 1.2. Um, sorry, it's negative 6, isn't it? Which gives me negative 1.2 meters per second squared. But what help is that? Well, I want to, ultimately, I want to use this equation, right? The force of friction, kinetic friction, is equal to mu times the normal force. Acceleration doesn't seem to be helpful there, but I also don't know what the force of kinetic friction is. Well, let's find the force of kinetic friction. But I don't know what the mass is. And if I don't know what the mass is to plug in here, and I don't know what the mass is, by the way, to plug in here either, what do we do? Let's try this. There's only one force acting on this puck as it's slowing down. It's friction. So it's mu times Fn. But the net force, which is a result of all the forces, which is a result of just one force here, is also equal to m times a. So let's set those two equal to each other. m times a is equal to mu times Fn. Usually I don't have to set them equal to each other like that. I can find F using m times a and then plug it in. But here I can't because I don't know what mass is. Fn is m times g. Look what happens. Mass cancels. So now I'm left with a is equal to mu times g, or mu, the coefficient of kinetic friction, is equal to a over g. So it's going to be negative 1.2. Uh, let's just drop the negative sign there, actually. 1.2 over 9.81. And that gives me a coefficient of friction of 0.12. Now, mathematically, that's not crazy hard. Um, the last question was a little bit trickier with the rearranging of the equation. This one's not so bad. But conceptually, this one's much harder. Yep. Yep. Yes, yes. OK, good question. When you get rid of the mass, you have to divide it on both sides, so wouldn't it go in under the coefficient here? Um, let's go back to that step here. We're saying m times a is equal to mu times m times g, right? So if we divide this side by mass, m divided by m is 1. If we divide this side by mass, m divided by m is 1. So we're left with a is equal to mu times g. So it just completely disappears. That was the point of setting the two equal to each other so that we could cancel out the mass. But, I mean, really, you know, you're a month and a half into Physics 20. Um, I would have been surprised if more than one or two of you would have ever thought of doing that. And I'm not surprised that nobody actually did think of doing that. So that's okay. It's a tough question. Another time, hey, you've got one more tool in the arsenal now. One more weapon in the arsenal to uh, to attack something with, okay? if you have to set something equal to something else. All right, the last mathematical question here, number five, and this one is uh, this one's not easy, but it goes back backwards in terms of being a little bit easier than question number four, I think. 
100 kilogram object is at rest on a horizontal table or surface. The coefficient of static friction is 0 0.6, kinetic friction is 0 0.45. If a force of 400 newtons is applied for five seconds, what's the force of friction acting on the object? Well, first of all, recognize that there's something that's already been given to you in this, que in this question that is completely and utterly irrelevant. What is that thing? What is that one thing that doesn't matter here? No, no, not that. Listen, it's at rest, and we push it, and we got to see if it moves. If a force of 400 newtons will move the object, then it will move the object. Lewis? Yep. No. Nope. It's the time. If I push it with 400 newtons, and it's going to move, it doesn't matter whether I push it for one second or five seconds or 10 million seconds. If it's going to move at 400, 400 newtons, it's going to move at 400 newtons. If it isn't going to move at 400 newtons, it doesn't matter how long I push it for. It's not going to move. So the five seconds is completely irrelevant here. What I care about is how hard I push it, not how long I push it. Now, if it moves and you push it for longer, you'll make it go faster. But that's not the question. The question here is basically, does it move? So the five seconds is irrelevant. Um, what we have to do in this is the same as we did in, our, in one of the examples we did yesterday, and that is find the maximum force of static friction, FSF max, mu times the normal force. Okay, that's going to be 0 0.60 times 100 times 9.81. Uh, and that gives me a value of 588.6 newtons. That's FSF max. That's the most force that we can apply before it begins to move. Okay, yesterday, the example that we kept giving you was Leah's desk. Remember, the max force of static friction was 50 newtons. If I applied a force of 51, it moved. If I applied a force of 49, it didn't move. If I apply a force of 400, does it move? Quick, yes or no? Who says yes? Who says yes, it moves? Who says no, it doesn't move? No is the correct answer. If I apply a force of 400 and the max force of static friction is 588, well, I haven't, I haven't exceeded it. That's like me pushing on Leah's desk with a force of 30 newtons when it takes 50 to move it. It doesn't move. So, what's the force of friction acting on the object in question A? Quick, what is it? 400 newtons. Friction is, how, static friction, that is, is however hard I push unless we exceed the maximum force. Okay. The force of 650 is applied for five seconds. What will be the force of friction? Does it move? Does it move here? Yes, it does. So now we've got to find the force of kinetic friction. FKF is equal to mu times the normal force. But this time, the mu that we're going to use is the kinetic friction coefficient, which is 0 0.45. 100 times 9.81. Do the math on that one, and it works out to be uh, 4.4 times 10 to the 2, or 440. Since it's moving, the coefficient is, and, uh, yeah, sorry, since it's moving, the force of kinetic friction is the force that acts on it, 4.4 times 10 to the 2 newtons. Um, what if I applied a force of 10,000 newtons? What would the force of friction be? Quick. 4.4 times 10 to the 2. Because once it moves and you're in kinetic friction, it's always going to be the same force of friction no matter how hard I push. How much applied force is required to get it moving, to start it moving? Quick answer, quick. 588.6 newtons. The max force of static friction. Okay, five is a good question. I like those questions, those number five questions. So, um, you know, the chances of you seeing something like number five again are, are pretty good, I would say. 
Yeah, that's true, actually. It should actually be 5.9 times 10 to the 2, two significant digits. Just as number 1 should be 4.0 times 10 to the 2. Yeah, both of them should be two digits. 6 and 7 are just qualitative. One situation where you want to have a low coefficient of static friction, one where you want to have a high. I help coach uh, my son's hockey team. Um, tonight we have a practice at 7.30 or something like that. Uh, one of the things you got to do is, you know, after the Zamboni comes on the ice and cleans the ice, you got to put the, put the hockey net down off of the boards because it's always leaned up against the boards, and then you got to push it. Okay? We want to have a pretty low coefficient of fr static friction when I go to push that net. You ever push a real hockey net? They're heavy. Like real hockey nets are heavy. You want to have a low coefficient of static friction because you got to get that hockey net moving. Right? You got to give it a push, and you don't have to push too hard to get it moving. What's another one? Sliding down the hill? Um, depends on if you want to slide down the hill or not. If you want to go down the hill, then yeah, you want to have a low coefficient of friction. If you're parked on the side of the road in your car, you probably don't want to slide down the hill, right? So you'd want to have a high coefficient of static friction in that case, right? One situation where you'd want to have a low coefficient of kinetic friction and one where you'd want to have a high coefficient of kinetic friction. I use the hockey net example again. Once I, once I get the net moving, it's moving. And it's easier to keep it moving than it is to get it started. But we still want to have a low coefficient of kinetic friction because I've got to push it all the way down the ice. Okay, when it's sliding, I don't want to have to push it that hard any more than I do when it's at rest. Where would we want to have a high coefficient of friction? Of dynamic friction. Another low coefficient, by the way, curling, curling rock on ice. Curling rock, 50 pound curling rock isn't going to get on the ice very well if, let's say, the ice is like concrete. Try throwing a 50 pound curling rock down a sheet of concrete. It's pretty hard. Not that I've ever tried it, but. I assume it would be pretty hard because of the high coefficient of friction. We don't want that, right? We want a low coefficient of friction between the ice and the curling rock. When, we want, when would we want a high one? Maybe when you're skidding in your car, the brakes are locked, the tires aren't moving, you're skidding on ice. We probably want to have a high coefficient of friction there because you want to stop, right? Any others? Anything that's sliding, right? Anything that's sliding and you want to stop. Anything that's sliding and you don't want to stop, you want to have the low coefficient. All right, that's it for today, guys. Perfect timing. Uh, no homework over the weekend. Uh, we'll pick this up uh, where we left off here on Monday. Have a good weekend, everyone.